U.S. anthropology. I've always presented this as anthropology being a four field discipline in the United States, a little bit different or a lot different in, in Europe and in the UK um, and in other places around the world. But in the United States, due to the founding, uh, the founding influence of Franz Boas, who we read about uh, in the first class, um, these we've always considered ourselves to be hopefully a four field discipline. Uh, these days I say North American anthropology because my last introductory textbook, there was a Canadian archeologist who reminded uh, the intro class that this is also true in Canada. And I think to a certain extent in Mexico as well. So in fact, in the North America anthropology is seen as a four field discipline. And so just, uh, you know, like I said, this will be perhaps a little bit of a review for those of you who are anthropology majors who have taken some other anthropology classes. But uh, one of the fields of anthropology is biological, which is sometimes, hopefully not so much anymore, called physical anthropology, deals with human evolution, biological aspects of human beings, also includes primatology. Um, here at Hartwick, we have uh, Professor Connie Anderson who teaches uh, courses in biological anthropology and in medical anthropology. Uh, really good stuff, um, especially if you're interested in um, nursing and uh, the applications of anthropology to that or else, else also uh, primatology and the biological anthropology things. Um, uh, some of you have probably been uh, either heard about or been on her January term experience to South Africa, a very popular uh, January J-term trip. Unfortunately, won't be going this year, but hopefully uh, you'll get a chance to do that if, if you're interested uh, next year. Um, archaeology, which is what a lot of people associate anthropo anthropology with, sort of stones and bones aspect of it uh, from those old Indiana Jones uh, movies, but archaeology is seen as one of the four fields of anthropology. Here at Hardwick, we have a Professor Namita Sugandi who teaches fundamentals of archaeology and also our upper level archaeology courses. Uh, runs a field school every other summer out at the Pine Lake Environmental Campus. Um, so if you're interested in archaeology, I really recommend uh, doing that. Linguistic anthropology combines anthropology with the study of language. And a lot of people who do cultural anthropology are also in some ways, it's impossible to do cultural anthropology without having some sense of what's going on in linguistic anthropology. But there is this uh, specialized subfield of linguistic anthropology, which Guest discusses. It's the smallest subfield of anthropology. It has the fewest number of practitioners, and it's usually very specialized. Um, and so we don't actually have at Hartwick as someone who's a specialist in linguistic anthropology. Super interesting, but also super difficult material too. So we'll be talking a little bit, when we talk about in the guest chapter on language, we'll be talking a little bit more about uh, linguistic anthropology. Uh, a lot of people kind of fold that into cultural anthropology, which is what we are studying in this class as a 200 level uh, cultural anthropology class. Um, for those of you who we're sort of thinking, well, I never took intro. Um, a lot of people teach cultural anthropology as their intro to anthropology. I know over at uh, the infamous SUNY Oneonta, uh, that's the way they do things over there. In fact, my wife teaches uh, in a 100 level cultural anthropology class in which she's used the guest textbook as well. So a lot of people uh, teach cultural anthropology more as a general uh, introduction. Um, here at Hartwick, we try to do an intro to anthropology, which is all four of these fields, and then all of those, uh, or the biological anthropology, archaeology, and cultural anthropology are 200 level classes. But I think in each case, if you're interested in it, you can sort of jump right in at the 200 level. So that uh, gives us an overview, again, a kind of general, what that sort of completes our quick snapshot of what is anthropology. We then move on to the idea of globalization. So what is globalization and why is it important for anthropology? And so guest in this textbook, of course, this is supposed to be a toolkit for a global age, talks to us about the idea of globalization. What is it? Um, in the last class, we talked about how 
human beings have always been interconnected. They have always been migrating, talking to each other, communicating with each other. This has been a characteristic of human beings since we were human beings. Globalization refers to an intensification of those processes. And there have been a lot of debates in academia about, you know, when does globalization begin? Uh, some people see it as a very recent phenomenon. The anthropologists that I like the most see it as something that sort of begins around 1500 with those first voyages of Columbus and other uh, European explorers uniting the world in a transoceanic network. It intensifies in the 19th century uh, with the Industrial Revolution in Europe and uh, the migrations uh, from uh, different parts of Asia and Europe and the Americas. There's an intensification and then there's another intensification we might say uh, from sort of 1989 on and that's actually what Guest here is referring to when he talks about globalization, sort of these important aspects of globalization. So none of these is entirely new, but we see these as intensified in recent years. So Guest discusses the idea of time-space compression, which is basically that the technologies that we have, the cell phones, but you know, before that, the phones, the transatlantic cables, the satellites, the transportation developments uh, enable people to be experience time and space differently than they might have in the past. And so the, you know, the sort of cliche is, you know, it's a small world. Um, this has probably been especially true with all these devices that we now have, where we can be in different places and yet have some feeling of being in the same place. And so if it weren't for the technologies that enable time space compression, we wouldn't be doing class like we're doing it now. This is entirely in, in fact a creation of sort of the global age where we can be simultaneously in all different places and in some ways, hopefully kind of communicating. Another example that get or another key characteristic of globalization that people talk about is the idea of flexible accumulation, which is basically that instead of producing things and selling things in one location, you can spread out both the production process and the consumption process across different regions. So you might be able to compose different parts of an automobile, put it together, uh, it's made in different parts of the parts of the world, it all comes together and then is sold for a profit in a new location. And I think, you know, you can sort of look at the labels on your clothing or the labels on your food or the labels on the stuff that's in your, your room and you see how, in fact, we have been influenced by these, these processes of flexible accumulation. Now, of course, again, this is not new. This is not a new thing. People have been trading things around for a long time. Uh, one of the one of the classic instances of flexible accumulation is how uh, we uh, had plantations with enslaved Africans in the Americas to ship sugar back to Europe. Um, so you know people have been doing this for a long time, but it seems to be with the coordination of computers and travel networks and containerization, it seems to be intensifying or can be intensifying in recent years. Third aspect is migration. Again, definitely not new. A million people a year migrated in the, the 19th century. So from 1800, or I mean from 1900, oops, from 1800 to 1900, almost a million people per year migrated. So this is not a new thing. Migration is part of the human experience. What may be new now is not necessarily the numbers of people, but how often people seem to be circulating, or they might make multiple migrations, or they may be sort of stuck between countries in a kind of refugee status or a kind of stateless uh, place where they belong to neither one country nor the country they are living in or migrated to. Again, this is not entirely new. My own great-grandparents migrated, 
into the United States from Italy and then went back to Italy. And then my grandfather came back to the United States. So there was a whole circuit of Italian migration through the Americas. They actually did, a lot of them never intended to stay in places like the United States and some of them just ended up here and we know about them because their descendants are here. So it's not that, that this sort of circular migration is anything new. However, of course, with the time space compression technologies, we may be more aware of it today. And like I said, there may be more instances of people who, who are unable to belong to any particular place because they are in a status of being displaced or being refugees from their uh, country of origin. And then we have the idea of uneven development. And this is simply that, you know, oftentimes when we hear the word globalization, we think about this sort of uh, level playing field of mixing and integration that everyone is sort of uh, coming into contact with each other and that, you know, the world has become a smaller place. Uneven development refers to how these things are sort of differently experienced based on where you are in the world, so perhaps what country you live in, but also often within the same country, how different that experience might be. And that you may share things, people who live in urban environments may share more with other people in other countries that live in urban environments than they do with people in their own countries who live in rural environments. And I used to ask the class how it felt for you to come to Oneonta, New York from wherever you are. And I thought, huh, maybe I'll ask that question again. So if if, 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 uh, if Zoom doesn't fail me, I'm going to try and do a poll and see, see if it works. Will it work? Ah, there it is. All right. Try this poll. So how does being an Oneonta compare to your home? There we go. Okay, so actually this is quite of interest to me. So the last time I did a poll like this was about 10 years ago, and about half the people said that it felt like it was being in the middle of nowhere, and about the other half said it was like being in the big city. Right now it looks like half of you say, ah, it's about the same as wherever I've been. About 30% of you say it feels like being in the middle of nowhere, and about 20% say it's feeling like being in the big city. The reason I kind of do this poll is actually because um, in some ways, uh, Hartwick College and our, our neighbor SUNY are relatively unique uh, in terms of a lot of colleges draw from a very similar population. So if you are in a rural area, that college will draw from the rural population. If you are in an urban area, it will draw from its urban population. Harwick is an interesting place because a lot of people come here from very much more rural areas and then a lot of people come here from very much more urban areas. And so it is itself, when these two areas come into contact, it's an instance of uneven development. Sadly, I think to a certain extent, we're probably seeing one of the effects of that with what is going on right now, where we were very rural for about five or six months from March through August. And Right there in August, we became all of a sudden urban, and now we are 
uh, experiencing what we're experiencing in terms of the COVID surge. So this is, again, an instance of what we might call uneven development, or even within the same country, within the same geographical space, you can have a very different experience of what is going on. And a lot of people uh, equate that or, or see that as an outcome of the process of globalization. Now, I want to go hopefully perhaps a little beyond guest here to say that, uh, you know, in some ways the idea of globalization has been with us for quite a long time. And how to say, 20 years ago, I taught a class called Latin America and Globalization. And so in some ways, I think that the idea of globalization has become uh, rather old or we might ask, is this still going on? Is this still the process which most characterizes our times? Or as I'll put it on this slide, is this still a global age? So what do I mean by that? Well, in the last few years, we've seen what we might call a resurgence of nationalist impulses. So globalization, of course, is supposed to be a world where borders are get, becoming less important. But what do we see? We see uh, the the rise of, and then again, this is not just in the United States, it's probably most famous to us because it is in the United States, the rise of politicians who are trying to revive senses of nationalism and a kind of nationalism that is very what they sort of call blood and soil nationalism. So that uh, it's not simply a, um, is, is not simply a sort of we're all in this together in this country, but that certain people belong to the country and certain people are uh, left outside of this national identity. Again, this is not just Trump. We saw a few years ago and preceding Trump, the vote in Britain to uh, execute what was called Brexit or the leaving of Britain from the European Union. So that these sort of some of these international organizations which once had sort of increasing uh, power over people's lives are in some ways perhaps being uh, rejected and, and replaced by or, or the idea is that there's a resurgence of nationalism in this time period. Linked to that are the new variety of border restrictions, the um, the sort of impetus against people who are migrating in, whether that be economic migrations, political migrations, refugees. We see this, of course, in the United States, the whole impulse to sort of, uh, the whole build the wall impulse uh, and to try and put up walls, to try and limit refugees, to limit migration. But this is not just in the United States. This is happening in different parts of Europe and different parts of Asia. Uh, globalization is often described as a world without borders and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 is seen as an example of ushering in this age of globalization. But the truth is people have been building more walls. They've been building walls around their neighborhoods and they've been building walls around their countries and they've been tightening border restrictions. Of course, we see that especially in this time when people started making all kinds of travel restrictions. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, the idea of time space compression is, is pretty difficult to comprehend now when people in the United States, we are unable to travel to a lot, a lot, a lot of different countries. Uh, I think Mexico will still let us in, but for now, Canada won't uh, and much of Europe won't. And so uh, it's very difficult uh, to think of a globalized world in which we are simply unable to even travel uh, internationally uh, at this time. But again, it goes with an, an earlier, uh, there have been increasing border restrictions uh, even in this world of globalization. Uh, the idea of globalization, which is a clever phrase that came out a couple of years ago in The Economist. Uh, and this is the idea that despite this, uh, the, the idea of economic integration, what we talked about is flexible accumulation and, and goods and trade being able to move into any uh, part of the world, that in fact, that has slowed down a lot. That in fact, is the 
global economy is being uh, integrated at a snail's pace these days, that some of the old trade agreements are, are being disrupted, are being upended. Uh, we saw in the last couple of years the renegotiation, for example, of NAFTA, uh, which largely appears intact, but you know, the idea was that we may be going uh, in the other direction in terms of the global integration of trade. And related to that is the new, uh, well, the relatively new divide between the United States and China. So you may have heard about the, the trade war that we were having with China, as well as then the trade agreements that we were having and what was going on there. But sort of behind the scenes of that, there's also been a kind of technological decoupling of the United States and China, where a lot of the uh, technologies that are used for cell phones and internet servers and those kinds of things are starting to uh, be politically divided and result in two different systems developing and a competition for which one is going to uh, kind of win the day, or maybe there'll be two separate or, or more separate platforms. You may be experiencing this a little bit in your life, uh, at least my kids are with the idea that will TikTok continue or will it be banned or will it be sold? And so TikTok might be seen as an example of a, you know, a, a, a development that, that, was, uh, that came, comes from China uh, and is very extremely popular all over the world, but various countries, not just the United States, have looked into kind of uh, are, are afraid of various parts of TikTok. And so they've we might be decoupling our TikTok or even perhaps uh, banning it entirely. But that's uh, an example of this larger possible divide between what was this humongously symbiotic relationship between the United States and importing uh, a huge number of Chinese goods uh, straight into Walmart and the, the holiday shopping uh, experience. And so this all uh, kind of leads up to the idea was, was globalization more hyped than it was real? The whole term globalization was actually a capitalist advertising slogan. It was meant to sell more products. And uh, my uh, anthropology advisor uh, once said that if we, if we didn't examine this, we ended up repeating advertising slogans without knowing where they came from. And so this was imported into social science and there were lots and lots of anthropology and sociology and political science classes about globalization. Um, anthropology, I think to its credit, has always insisted that globalization is, is very long and deep and has a long history. Um, and so we don't wanna get necessarily caught up in the hype of globalization. Uh, there are important aspects that are new to our time, but we don't want to start thinking that it's sort of this one way process. And so if you think about all the things we've just talked about, we can think about how in some ways, uh, a lot of the things that used to be seen as integrating the world are in fact resulting in, uh, in deeper disintegration or a slowness of integration. At the same time, I think in the last year or two years, um, a number of issues have come into our lives or are in our lives that show us how deeply interconnected we really are. And you, we may, you know, people have been drawn to nationalism and national solutions, but the issues of, there are a number of issues that are simply uh, they go beyond national borders and you can't put walls up around them. They will, they're, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be answered by limiting things like migration or trying to, to limit travel or limit the technologies that make globalization possible. One of them is what uh, guest discusses in terms of the environment and environmental issues, global climate change. Um, we have guests wrote in this edition, his third edition, he has a whole new chapter on uh, anthropology and the environment, which we'll read later. And this is a, a huge improvement, I think, from uh, the, the last edition of the textbook. It was a very big missing piece because this is a, an issue that is about the future, about sustainability, about that will 
you know, is and will be affecting all of us. And there is not a, there is no way to solve this simply from a national or uh, a national perspective. Of course, uh, guest textbook was written and published before the coronavirus, but here is another thing that does not respect national borders. We've had, of course, as we just talked about, travel limitations and all kinds of people trying to clamp down on it by restricting people's movement, but it seems not to care so much. Uh, and some of those travel restrictions seem to have actually uh, kind of uh, reinforced or, or spread the virus more as everybody tries to get back from wherever they were before the travel ban goes into effect. Uh, can have actually the opposite effect as was intended. And so uh, public health uh, is a global issue now, and we're really feeling uh, one, of the, one of the problems in our response is we are feeling the lack of a global coordinated response to what is a global issue. So this is something the United States used to lead the way on. Uh, actually, uh, we did, for example, with the Ebola outbreak, uh, kind of leading the way to coordinate a global or an international effort uh, with coronavirus, there has simply not been a, an international coordinated global effort in order to come up with a global strategy. In fact, some countries uh, like our own seem to be lacking even in a national strategy to combat it, let alone a global strategy. Uh, some of you mentioned in your discussion post, uh, Black Lives Matter. And I think that, you know, as of a couple years ago, the issues of Black Lives Matter were seen as relatively unique to the United States, relatively particular, relatively small, or not small, but relatively limited to the United States, in part because unlike other parts of uh, parts of Europe and the rest of the world uh, were one of the few developed countries in which the police are always carrying weapons and we are one of the most heavily armed people in the world and so this seemed to be uh, something that was uh, limited to uh, the United States. However, with the recent protests we saw not only more support than ever before if within the United States, but we also saw international support for the Black Lives Movement. So international support for the Black Lives Movement from many other countries. And not only that, but other countries are turning the uh, movement onto issues in their own society. So seeing the issue of racial justice or justice for indigenous peoples or for Aboriginal Australians as part of this global effort. And uh, it's partly in support of what is happening uh, in the United States, but partly uh, turning it onto their own societies. And so I think we've also started to realize that all these issues are, are not only global, but they are interconnected. So that racial justice, environmental justice, public health justice, economic justice, are global issues and they are connected to each other. They are not going to be solved separately from each other. Uh, all of these, uh, what we might say, movements or ideas are interconnected and uh, must be dealt with uh, globally and together. And so that brings us to Thinking Like an Anthropologist guest ends each chapter with a little segment, which is often very good for sort of applying uh, what's in the chapter. And uh, I will probably often take uh, discussion prompt questions from these sections. Uh, so here guest tells us that, you know, if we're going to solve the challenges that face our humanity in our lifetime, we need greater engagement, interaction, and cooperation, not more isolation and ignorance. And so on the discussion board, I asked to what extent do you personally believe in this statement? And also, how do you think other people in the United States are believing this statement? So in my reading of your post, it of course warms my heart to see how many of you strongly believe or strongly endorse or say it's 100% correct that we are going to have to have greater engagement interaction and cooperation. And I say it warms my heart because over the past few years, I would say being a professor has been an 
interesting challenge in the sense that a lot of the skills that we are trying to un cover or unpack or develop skills like appreciating diversity, communicating, uh, being able to read, write, spell, uh, do all these things, uh, debate, have been, uh, civilly debate, I should say, uh, have been undervalued. As I say, we've been, uh, we've been exposed to uh, people who basically are saying that to succeed in the world, to succeed politically or to succeed economically or to, to succeed in, in, in business, that you don't need any of those things. And in fact, you get more retweets and likes and followers if you say things that are isolated and ignorant than it seems like if you say things that are about engagement, interaction and cooperation. Now, I think that, you know, hopefully that is a uh, we're, on, we're hopefully going to be on the other side of that arc, but it's been an interesting time to try and uh, try to convince people that it is a good thing to know how to communicate effectively um, and how to uh, try to reach across what might be uh, diverse perspectives in order to understand and to talk things through. So it's also, you know, it, it is also uh, interesting heartbreaking to read how so many of you think that in some ways the United States is perhaps going in the wrong direction or split 50-50, uh, which seems to be our political situation. We always seem to be cut right down the, the polarized, uh, po more polarized than, than pulling together. Um, there's a lot of ways to read this guest quote, I think. I mean, I think that as one of you put it, of course it's true, of course it's true. It's, it's a given that it's true. Um, I, in rereading it this time, I'm kind of struck by the idea that if we want to solve these challenges, so do we even want to solve these challenges? I think in the last few years, we've been told that those challenges don't even exist. We don't, they, they're not even there. Global climate change isn't, isn't even a thing we're told. Um, so, you know, that we don't exist or they're unsolvable or it's stupid to even bother to solve them. So I think this statement is true. And I think, you know, we, we, we do live in the balance of things where, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of think about this. Um, it often also makes me think about, you know, my own classes in anthropology. Do anthropologists, do anthropology classes actually help us get to greater engagement, interaction, and cooperation? Or is it simply the people who are interested in greater engagement, interaction, and cooperation join anthropology classes?